Hi everyone, welcome to SHL Fireside Chat. This is Lance, Renee, nice to talk to you again. And we're welcome to May. It's, it's hard to believe it's already gone an, a month of these, over a month, how are you doing? Still hanging in there, <laughs> how about you? Not too bad. Um, we're gonna jump, this is a, usually get a little bit more of a prelude, but uh, Renee and I were already talking to our, to our guest and longtime friend, Will Stoughton, and you have to give him credit, Will, uh, awesome that you actually went to the fire and you're sitting beside the fire for this fireside chat. So we'll give you an introduction, but we're going to jump right in because we're having a really good conversation and we figured we couldn't uh, keep the guests from this. So Will, we, we go back, we work together. Uh, you've worked at the at SHL for a while. Um, now you're working at Glint. So you want to give the audience an introduction, and tell them who you are, what you do and what, what uh, kind of work you've been doing recently. Yeah, absolutely. So um, like, like both of you all trained as an IO psychologist, spent time, uh, at SHL CEB Gartner. I actually was two years a field um, before joining Glint. So I spent two years at an AI for um, materials and chemicals companies, uh, AI as a service. So it was really how the world of work was changing for material scientists, chemists, uh, fiber and polymer scientists. And it was kind of that domain specific AI and looking at where is that being done in the HR space that actually brought me back to human capital. I now am at Glint, a uh, director of strategy. So it's really looking at some of the ways in which we can help organizations in, in Glint's place, uh, in Glint's case, individuals be happier and more successful at work. So that's, that's kind of where I am today. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And joining us. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, so, um, you know, I had had the opportunity, Lance, to, to talk with you a little bit about distance learning, how things are going. But Renee, I, you know, hadn't had the opportunity recently to catch up. So I was just kind of curious as to how everything was going on that front for you. Yeah, you know, um, I think so I have a, a five-year-old and a nine-year-old and then my husband and I working like all, all in the same place. And um the first three or four weeks with the distance learning actually seemed to be going like pretty darn well. Um, but around week three or four with the five-year-old, it just, you know, I think it's just hard. I think at that age, they just really want to interact and everybody else has more individual work that they could be doing. And everyone, you know, is trying to give her time, but I think it's just frustrating and they're, we're all social beings, but they're little social beings. And, you know, you start to see, more frustration, which leads to more fuss or more behavior correction. And nobody wants to be behaviorally corrected all day if they're five or if they're 50. Um, so it's, it's been, feels like we kind of moved into a different phase that we're trying to figure out the best way to, to navigate at this point. Yeah. How about you, it's, Phil? Like I know you have even like smaller kids. Yeah. So Charlie's, Charlie's five, Maria's two. So it is smaller kids and um, you know, my wife and I both work. And we were doing split days where it was, you know, four hour block, four hour block and trying to kind of have appropriate flexibility on the tail end. Um, but it, what was really interesting to me was, it was really early on COVID crisis, I want to say March timeframe. And Dan Shapiro, who's the chief business officer at LinkedIn, had this post that was incredible in setting the tone for kind of the way in which I've thought about it moving forward, which was there's bound to be human and technical interruptions at this time. So don't apologize for it, right? You, you're kind of talking about how your five-year-old needs that human interaction. Mine manifests that in walking in the middle of the call asking for a hug. So I don't know how many colleagues I have had seen me give Charlie a hug uh, mid-call, but it's one that, you know, can't, can't or don't feel like the, have the need to apologize for that anymore. That's, that's fantastic. And I, we, I feel like we've really seen the same thing where um, maybe before it's like everybody still had a personal life, whether it involved kids or not or other things. But professionally, it seemed like a lot of the time we were supposed to all pretend that wasn't happening. And right now, nobody is obligated to pretend about that. And it's been so interesting to see how that changes both like our internal relationships with our coworkers, um, the nature of client relationships and meetings. And there's a lot about it that's really, I think, nice and refreshing. And I hope that part, whatever it is that, not the going back to normal, I guess the new normal, whatever it is after this, I hope we retain some element of that. 
um, because it feels like it's got to be better for people's well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, my wife used to have what she referred to as donut meeting on Fridays, right? And so it was an opportunity for people to talk about things outside of work, right? You weren't supposed to bring kind of work to that conversation. And Lance and I were in an office together previously, and you would travel to the office on a fairly regular basis. Um, and you'd have that interaction kind of like water cooler conversation. I'm going to date myself by saying water cooler. Uh, Cliche but you would have that. <laughs> what? Cliche check number one for those playing yeah. video there. Well, uh, how about cafe station conversation, <laughs> right? Like, we got to have our fizzy water and our snack of the month. There we go. Um, so uh, coffee station conversation, um, I, totally whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's one where now we don't necessarily, we, we don't have that opportunity anymore, but it was one where, you know, I'd ask Lance how his kids are doing or how your kids are doing. Um, or, you know, an interest that you might have, right? Like I, sorry, I have a, I have a glass of iced coffee. You can't see the ice because it's so clear, right? It's those things where Lance and I are catching up on these hobbies that we might have. And they, they canceled that in kind of the first, um, first week post uh, work from home. And, you know, I said to my wife, I was like, I don't think that's something that you want to cancel. There's an opportunity for you to have a, a promotion of well-being by continuing to have that human interaction, that connection virtually. Uh, and so it was one where immediately she got that calendar invite back up and they had a virtual donut. Um, so, it, you know, it kind of was, was a way to continue to have those things. And they actually have like a new format that they're using for it. Uh, and it's one that I think to your point, Renee, may persist post, you know, return to work where mm -hmm. they might continue to do it in that way, which, um, in the case, the, this, this is a format that I had actually taken from my last organization, which was teach me something. So it was talk about a hobby that you have, um, if we're all people scientists, uh, in this case, it was she was explaining the science of clear ice to, to her colleagues. So they're all, you know, chemists or uh, trained in a similar way. So it was one that resonated from for them and it got to show a little bit of a hobby. Um, it was, you know, I thought it was a kind of a cool way to take that forward. And we've all learned a little bit about directional freezing as a result of <laughs> clear ice for morning drinks or PM drinks, right? Yeah, for your, your corn tiki drink. Yeah. So, so Will, you know, speaking of kind of, you know, the things that are coming out of this, but what, how are, it, at Glenn, you have a lot of engagement data. What are you seeing? Like, what are some of the things that organizations are, are learning from their employees? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Um, we've been posting some of those insights to uh, LinkedIn. Justin Black, our uh, head of people science, has been really phenomenal at sharing some of those insights as they come in. Um, at this point, we have over 2.5 million data points as it relates to engagement on COVID-specific topics. And one of the things that I think is interesting is how it's changed as kind of the, the crisis has evolved. And that can be what, you know, feedback you might be asking about at any given time related to that or how there might be differences between managers and individual contributors. That was one of, you know, Justin's most recent posts um, talking about the sentiment uh, related to prioritization that you would see from managers versus individual contributors and the differences that exist there. Uh, so it's, it's really been interesting from that perspective, but I feel like the biggest takeaway for us is that it's still an opportunity to ask for feedback from employees on how things are going for them at work from a well-being standpoint um you know it's just a, a phenomenal opportunity to get that kind of feedback yeah. what are 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 there any things and it, it sounds like there's some posts um out there already which 
I'm guessing Lance has probably read, and I probably haven't because he's much better about that sort of thing than I am. But like, are there are there interesting trends that are coming out about what those individual contributor prioritizations versus manager or things by like industry or geography or anything like that? Yeah, so just some of the, the early ones, um, you know, that are coming out in terms of the way in which uh, things are changing as it relates to the, the, the kind of uh, feedback, or it's not so much a change, but it's more of what are some of those um, things to think about. Prioritization actually was one, right? So managers in particular are less likely to utilize positive words or phrases when talking about prioritization. And it makes it feel, or, or it kind of suggests that some of them feel like they're setting team goals without real clarity on, uh, or from leadership in terms of what they should be prioritizing. So it's one of those things where if you think about some of just fundamentally, like basic need would be understanding as it relates to how you would succeed in your job is understanding how your individual contribution leads to kind of overall contribution of work and the lack of direction as you go further up on the ways in which that's happening. Um, so to see that it's, you know, it's kind of uh, interesting that you're having that dichotomy between managers and individual contributors. As you were saying that, for some reason, <laughs> the, the thing that popped in my mind was, are you, like, has there been any part of the data where you've been able to see a somehow categorize organizations that are maybe experiencing more furloughs or job loss or pay reduction versus organizations that aren't in like what that experience like looks like or is how it might be different? Yeah, so I, I think all, all of those are uh, like incredibly interesting questions. We're still starting to dive into uh, the, the data related to that. And we have a, a whole team. Yeah, so it's you know, <laughs> our people science analytics teams that's starting to um, work through some of those data. Um, and I, I think there's a tangentially related topic, which is how might you be surveying differently um, based on the type of industry that you're in and what that looks like. The way in which it kind of comes up a lot in topics is, um, frontline workers, right? So being at healthcare, grocery, um, transportation is a big one right now that, that we're seeing um, versus, you know, individuals like knowledge workers where we might, uh, you know, very easily be able to turn ourselves into remote workers. I, I'm, I, am, I am a remote worker um, day in and day out. I, I spend a lot of time on the road, but I have a remote set up um, that I can go to constantly. And that's one where, you know, the questions you might ask are pretty similar, if not the same, but the way in which it, it actually um, is interpreted is, it can be slightly different, right? And the example that I would give would be early on when we were making a transition to remote work, it would have been, uh, you know, a question of, do you have the resources that you need to get your job done? And for the three of us, it's, do you have a monitor? You know, Lance, is your new headset working, your new microphone? Um, do you have an ergonomic desk, right? Because now you're, you're probably not getting up to go to the coffee station as much um, or things of that nature. And that's, you know, very specific to that type of work. Whereas, do you have the resources you need to get your job done for a frontline worker is, do you have PPE, right? Do you have your N95 mask? Do you feel comfortable and safe in that workplace? It's like fundamental safety, um, not, you know, is your keyboard ergonomically correct? Yeah, yeah do you fear um, so, long-term, you know, work-related, like, you know, posture or, uh, carpal tunnel or something like that. It's not the same. It's like a, a, an immediate threat. Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we're seeing, you definitely see that uh, differently um, across organizations. And it's one where we've been able to see, we, we've had, you know, healthcare organizations that have administered uh, COVID related surveys. And so we're able to see, you know, what some of the, the ways in which 
um, they're getting that information. And in some instances, it's been really interesting because it's been an opportunity to see are the perceptions and um, kind of uh, information that they're gleaning from the news, is it actually what resonates with the individuals in the workplace? So are they seeing what they get from the news as a source of truth for um, what they're, they're actually uh, have as it relates to PPE, for instance, right? So the news saying that there's a shortage and not understanding that, you know, their particular healthcare system actually has the needed PPE and that they don't need to be worried about that type of thing. Um, but being able to get that information and understand that type of information from your employees just kind of highlights you know, how this, this still is a phenomenal time to be asking for feedback. Yeah, actually quantifying the, the true sentiment is more important than ever. I mean, even uh, you mentioned the healthcare, my sister works in healthcare. She's not a, a nurse or anything that's in the front lines of COVID, but she's a, an occupational therapist that is impacted because some of these people are going to have to, you know, be rehabilitated now. Are they going to be infected or are they not? And then and just, can they not see their traditional patients as well? So that has an impact on, whether or not their 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 beds are full, or they you know they can actually have work. So there's those stressors yeah. around the, the like the downstream effects too, and it's probably good to know how those people are actually feeling. Do you see anything yeah. about like the non frontline in healthcare? I don't know if you have any way of parsing it out, but you know the people dealing with the, the obviously immensely stressful, um, but people that are in the hospital systems that are away from that, seeing any differences there. Um, so this is, this is different and this isn't actually, this would be data that I'd be pulling in from elsewhere, um, where, uh, the chief economist at LinkedIn had done a uh, post very recently looking at what are the jobs that are still in highest demand. So if we think back to, um, ONET and how you had the, the job categories that were, um, those that are most in demand, some of the ones that were appearing there were the same sorts of, of jobs that you're talking about, Lance, um, in terms of hiring demand currently, like through the last two months of, of COVID crisis, uh, one of which um, I was thinking of, it, it's a uh, speech pathologist therapist is in one of those top 10 jobs. I think of like Andy's uh, wife, for instance, and the, and the work that she does in her practice still being incredible high demand at this time because you, you do have, you know, those individuals that still have that need. Um, so kind of interesting, similar data, but not necessarily on, uh, you know, how, how they're handling it now. And I'm, I'm guessing maybe that y'all haven't had the chance to get this like um, finely grained analysis into the data yet, but um, I live very close to the Texas Medical Center in Houston. And so healthcare is a big part of both just the people around and, um, you know, the local news and, and whatnot. And one of the things that I've been thinking about that is like so interesting is that there are certain types of roles in the healthcare system right now that are absolutely slammed. And then there are other people that because of the way um, laws and rules have been enacted are actually have essentially not been working. And depending on whether or not they work for a small practice, um, they're independent or they work for a healthcare system, they might have actually either lost their job or been furloughed or, you know, are out of income. Um, and so it, I guess it makes me think about like this potential situation where you could even be working for the same large system and your experience, depending on what type of service you provide, whether it's inpatient in a hospital um, that's affected by COVID. So it's like an ICU or dialysis or like what have you versus um, the person who was associated with elective sur surgeries that have been completely shut off. Like that's two very different employee experiences at the exact same time in the exact same company, which would, I mean, wrapping your mind around how you attend to the well-being and the communication needs of both of those groups at, at the same time is pretty, it's a pretty high, high bar right now to hit. Oh, absolutely. And it's one where the, the technology obviously exists for individuals to um, survey in that way, right? So those health systems can uh, parse that really quickly and easily within, you know, a, a survey system or a pulsing system to understand what are the differences between those two types of workers. And it's one that 
is very salient to healthcare systems because you do, you know, you gave the example of, of kind of individuals that have been furloughed. There's also a large administrative staff in those systems that can immediately go to, you know, a remote working situation or semi immediately go to a remote mm-hmm. working situation. So you, you actually now probably have three different populations um, within that, that base that have these very different needs. Um, again, though, I think of you still have similar questions with which mm-hmm. you can be asking them. And then I, I think it's kind of the point that you're making, Renee, is you would very much need to be attending to or interpreting those things differently based on what job classification you know, they, they would have. Um, I, I think the other thing that's interesting in that context is the way in which you might reach out. So for those individuals that are completely slammed, um, the, you know, the kind of fear of survey fatigue is one that, I, I mean, we hear it constantly in a non, um, you know, kind of COVID uh, related time frame. With the healthcare industry, it's, it's one where there's a, a lot of surveys that they have to do, right? So they got to do their magnet surveys. They got to do um, different physician surveys as it relates to patient care, et cetera. So they're already kind of inundated. It makes different ways in which to reach out pretty salient. So you could take an approach of instead of saying, let's not push something to them. Let's give them the opportunity to go somewhere if they have something. So it's, it's, don't push it on everybody, but give those individuals that have something that they want or need to say the opportunity to do so and allow them to do it when they have the time to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, So that it's not kind of asking here and now, and you know, you have no opportunity to do so otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And this this question probably belies the lack, like engagement is further in the field of my professional daily life. Um, But I, I would guess that like a lot of people's first reaction would uh, people being like actually like internal folks trying to do engagement that, um, well, if we just put a link up there and people can go to it if they want to, what's the uptake on that going to actually be? But it sounds like from what you're saying that there are like kind of maybe best practices around how you communicate the availability of that and, mm-hmm. and continue maybe to do that in a way that actually does drive a meaningful number of people to use the resource. Um, if they need to do it, which is yeah. exciting because that that seems like a harder behavioral um, experience to drive <laughs> um, than, yeah, than just simply pushing a survey. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's interesting because obviously one of the things that we track is participation rates in surveys. And there was a big fear with some of the organizations that were putting out early uh, COVID-related pulses that there was going to be a you know a precipitous drop in participation and scores because of they might have just done a survey this is outside of their you know typical survey cadence um fears that they were being inundated with with other things at this time there's just so much going on that you know they, they wouldn't possibly want to survey the the kind of early returns were high participation rates high scores Um, especially as it related to, you know, the opportunity or the ability to give feedback at this time. Um, We had some, and these are, these are obviously um, anecdotal in terms of uh, I've gotten this kind of through the chain of employees that have said thanks to, you know, leadership within their organizations for the opportunity to say how they're feeling at this time. Um, So it's, it's definitely been one where, giving the opportunity to talk about how you're doing um, it has been one that's that's been really well received. Um, and yeah, to your to your point, it's it's one where it was, let's think about what is the best way in which to do this and ensure that we we are getting people to participate and and they are for the most part. Are there are there areas within the data that you get back and maybe this not across the board, but within pockets of, of organizations, you know, I think like a team or a department where individuals will be having a dip in engagement or, or feedback that, and that you can kind of pinpoint the things that the behaviors that managers are doing differently that are causing those dips. So 
essentially the question is what should managers do and what shouldn't they do as they're managing it? I think maybe a remote work uh, transition would be the uh, an example. Is there anything that you're seeing that causes either spikes or decreases in, in engagement based on those transitions? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is burnout, right? So uh, it's it's a big question around well-being and how individuals are doing as we're getting further into uh, the work from home situation. My manager increased the frequency of our one-on-ones. So we now have uh, twice one-on-ones twice a week. Uh, so semi-weekly, semi-weekly uh, is, is the, the f- way in which we have that. And it's just an opportunity for us to have conversations more, right? So don't, don't ignore the conversation elements to it. We start with just how we're doing, you know, so we have, we have some shared common interests and that's one of the things that we talk about in our one-on-ones on the front end. Um, and it's an opportunity for, for us to have that interaction, for him to get feedback from me and, and how I'm doing, but it's, it's definitely one where scores indicate that that's a, you know, a particular area of concern. And it's one that conversations, well-being, and, and trying to understand, you know, what's going on is, is helpful uh, moving forward. So it's, it's definitely one where don't think that this isn't the time to have have one-on-ones or have conversations. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's definitely one where that's that's a big part of it. Yeah, at least you, if you, the communication probably has to be, you have to provide the opportunity, right? So I can see it going the other way, like stop with, I have too much going on, please let's, let's, let's not have more meetings. But if the manager isn't asking, that could, I can see how that could be problematic because then you, you don't feel like you have the outlet to, to connect and The other thing that I was thinking about as you were saying that, Will, is um, it seems very clear to me how you find the opportunity in the space to do that through something like a one-on-one for knowledge workers like ourselves. Um, Thinking about how somebody who's managing a team in a grocery store or in a hospital or in some other (laughs) works, like in a warehouse distribution or delivery drivers, like those people, if anything, probably even more need the opportunity to know one that their manager wants to talk about that stuff if they if they want to and have a space to do it but are even in a much at least in, I haven't immediately thought of an easy scalable way for them to create that same opportunity in in those situations um, is that like anything that has come up in the, the, I don't know if it would be in the data that you'll have or just in the like client conversations that you've been having about how, how to create that same kind of experience um, for worker populations where it doesn't as naturally occur. Yeah, so I, I haven't been close enough to kind of that particular type of conversation to be able to speak super intelligently uh, on it, if I'm just being candid. Um, sure. It's definitely one you know, that comes up and it's one that just from like a general survey standpoint, um, you need to think through in terms of how do you access, you know, those, those types of populations um, to one, get their feedback outside of necessarily like the one-on-one context. Uh, So it's, it's one that I think is kind of constantly a question that people have and, and one that comes up. Um, I, I, I'm remiss. Uh, we were talking about one of my, so one of my colleagues um, worked in the retail space for the, well, more than a decade, um, handling that type of question. Uh, so <laughs> I'm a little bit, you know, remiss that I had not uh, thought to ask, ask him beforehand what, what the answer might be there. Um, but yeah, definitely one where uh, kind of constantly grappling with how do you reach those individuals? How do you take the the time and opportunity to do so? Um, Especially where that type of feedback might not be as, as you say, readily able to give um, in in terms of one-on-one. And we, we work with like several, we're in the process of, of projects with several large retailers right now. And, and I hadn't necessarily like thought to ask the question either um, until you were talking about it. Um, now, it like, makes me now want to go back and ask and be like, I know this project we're working on really isn't about this, but 
we were having this conversation and now I'm curious and, and what does that look like? Maybe we can update folks next week. And maybe you can uh, ask that, uh, that colleague uh, that lives in Minnesota <laughs> what his was too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One of the things I mean, I think fundamentally I was also just curious with just the, the sensitivity around, you talked about the, the frequency and the potential for fatigue, you know, finding alternative ways of not just pushing out the surveys, but allowing people to you know, find the surveys so they can provide the feedback. Is there like more fundamentally, should you change what you're asking? Like should, should organizations, uh, same old engagement survey or the pulse surveys or whatever you're doing, or should you change that to have a specific, you know, either whether it's a COVID related or just remote work, some of those transitions, any, any thoughts there? Yeah. Um, so, the one thing that you don't want to be doing right now is seem out of touch. And so if you were to administer your, your kind of typical uh, pulse survey, it's probably not going to feel highly relevant at this point. And so it, ensuring that you're attending to um, the, you know, uh, topic at hand is going to be something that's, that's particularly relevant. Um, what I think is, is also interesting within the context is that the needs have changed from start to finish in terms of what you might be administering. So on the front end, we had kind of highlighted the example of, um, you know, moving to remote work and um, feeling safe in the workplace. Now it's more well-being, burnout. How can you ask questions related to that? And then I'm seeing in the news a lot of, uh, you know, move to what's the return to work going to look like? What is um, kind of that, that new normal going to be. And, I, you know, you're going to likely have a shift in terms of uh, questions there as well. So asking, asking frequently to, to be able to get the feedback as the situation changes, because it's been changing on a, you know, week to week basis is incredibly helpful. Um, this actually came up in another roundtable discussion that I was participating in where somebody was asking it from the context of they had just administered a survey. They are once a year cadence. So they, they did it. It's something that, you know, it's kind of that big, um, big process when you're, you're doing it only once a year and, and it's pretty um, hyper salient. And the week that they were supposed to communicate the results back, was the week that they all moved to remote work. So all of a sudden it didn't seem like the, the thing that they should be communicating at that time. <laughs> um, and, and so the question was, what do you do with that? Um, and that's one where there, there's likely some questions that you have on that survey that are going to be related to how you're handling, you know, the current crisis. But it's, it's also an opportunity to say, here's the things we saw in the survey those are important, but maybe not that important right now. And we will address them when we reach a time with which it's appropriate. But right now, these are the things that I know you all are focused on. So let's take, let's take a step back. Let's ask some questions there and get an opportunity for how are we doing at, you know, the, the kind of issue at hand. Um, so there, there's still an opportunity um, to ask questions, uh, you know, to do that even when it's maybe out of sequence of your typical cadence. Got a bit of people would see that as, you know, we want to know, we want to make sure we're, things are changing quickly. We have to have information. We have to have your input and we want to be reactive to whatever is on your minds and what, what the sentiment is. It changes so rapidly from, I think the joke that we were, that I was talking to Renee earlier, it feels like it was an instant March. It just flew by like that. And, or March took forever and April has been just like gone, gone in a second. So March was just kind of like dragging on, took, felt like a year. And then April, it's already May. Like, wow, that's, so <laughs> which, the, the, the temporal shift is, is weird too. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I, I'll, I'll flip it on you on that, uh, Lance, because I, I mean, I've got two selection folks in the room, right? So there's an opportunity where you guys would think about it within the context of um, candidate feedback and like the, the why do you ask for candidate feedback? What, um, what does the recruitment process do as far as 
signaling to an individual how they would likely be treated at an organization. Um, in, in, in my world now, I think about it from the standpoint of it's an opportunity for organizations to ask how can we jointly think about this issue and it's a phenomenal signal on the way in which uh, you know the organization values the opinion of the employee and the way in which you can use their shared experience to uh, you know address and solve um, some of the, the problems at hand. I, I imagine it's similar you know conversation that you're grappling with with organizations that are hiring uh, through this because I mean, we have seen some um, uptick in certain uh, pockets of the, the labor force in terms of need for individuals. Yeah, there's, there's one example there where we have one client who's um, a major retailer, but um, uh, not grocery. So they have been shut down um, and they've made the choice to actively um, help their employees and partner with retailers like grocery stores and pharmacies and hardware stores who do have a need. Like they on their website are very easily making it clear to, for their, their employees who have essentially been furloughed <laughs> and are without a job, how to go over here and get a new job, knowing that that's probably going to make it harder for them to come back and, and rehire those employees, which they will need to do a, a bunch of them like instantaneously but feeling like from an employee um, value prop employer value proposition um, brand perspective and then just from a I think the right thing to do perspective that that that's what they um, are doing and we've talked to to some clients we've talked both conceptually about this and then to some actual clients about um, you know your landing page for candidates now probably needs to look different um, and what you're telling them and even if you don't if you know you're not going to be doing any hiring immediately some kind of message that acknowledges like how appreciative you are that they're coming and looking that, um, you know, you as an organization can't wait to get back to a place where you're hiring um, and really setting a, um, an emotional and empathic and like human tone that acknowledges the situation that's happening. Um, I, I will be a differentiator. I think people will remember um, those kinds of, attitudes when they when they know that they're happening um, yeah. from employers for, for that organization Renee I'm curious because you had you had said you know from an employee value proposition standpoint right and that's one where straddles our two worlds right one of the things mm -hmm. in which we oftentimes are trying to understand is what is the employee value proposition of the organization that we might sum up into a couple of statements and if that then gets deployed for somebody on, on your side is going to utilize that to attract those individuals that are aligned to that value proposition. But there's also the value proposition that the company believes it has and the one that the organization is striving to, the one that employees see and then the one that resonates for employees in the organization and yeah you know, that are, that are external. So I, I'm curious in that instance, that sounds like one that would have been kind of shared across kind of all four of those groups for that organization. Um, is that, is that so, is that something that you're seeing pretty common in the process or does it feel um, like a shift? I, I don't know that it's common. Um, I don't have like another three examples off the top of my head that I can point to of that. I, I, my, my sense is that it did start more um, actually thinking about the internal employees and are now not employees and what was happening with them. Um, and this being the kind of action that um, presumably would show really live living what they are saying is the employee yeah. or value proposition is. Um, and then the realization, and, and I think it actually, I don't want to say this for sure, but it, part of that might've been some of the conversations with, with us where we were hearing about this and we're kind of saying, this is something that candidates need to know. Like when you come back, it needs to be clear to candidates that this is how you care about your employees. This is what you did. Um, even when it wasn't in your self-interest, um, because that's a, a real life, tangible, pretty like undeniable and impactful example of um, an employee like statement or value statement that a lot of organizations might have who wouldn't have done the same thing. Um, so I think it I think that's 
my sense of how that evolved. And I think just additionally, I mean, this is an age old uh, truism about applicant, the applicant experience is that fairness is important, right? I mean, mm -hmm. procedural justice, we learned about that this in grad school, but the way that you demonstrate that fairness has changed. And, you know, when unemployment was a three, you know, taking between three and 4%, the fairness question is, is one, is the way you demonstrate that was different. Now that you've got 24 million new, 27 million new people unemployed, how do you make sure that they feel that they're given their fair shake at getting the job? And how do you manage those volumes in a way that helps, helps and back to the whole empathy uh, conversation we were show, talking about earlier, like how do you do that in an empathetic way that lets people know that you're, you care about them and you want to give them the fair shot of giving, of getting employment at your, at your organization? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's made doubly so, and I'll, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Renee. I was going to say it's made doubly so from the standpoint of if you look at year over year hiring at this time, yeah. um, you're seeing sharp declines in, uh, I'll speak to the United States in particular, because that's where you're seeing it. And country by country, as you've seen kind of waves of COVID, it looks different, right? Um, China actually had an uptick in year over year hiring um, once they've gone back uh, to kind of reopening the economy. But it's one where now you're hiring less, you do have more. Um, so those two things are, are kind of compounding uh, that issue, um, which is interesting in the context with which that's all created. Yeah, I think if I'm following where you're going, well, like the last time, at least in the U.S., we were really in something closer to this dynamic, like clearly unemployment wasn't where it's at now, but where it was really... Um, the the employer who was in the driver's seat and had the choice and the pick. Um, I think in general, the last time we had that, um, no one was spending a lot of effort to make those candidates feel um, warm and loved and like they were human and being treated to. It was like, no, you can be a number because we can afford for you to be a number. Um, whereas it feels like this time going back, even though in some ways from a, mathematical perspective, they will have even more choice than they did 10 years ago. It is going to be important to still um, have that, the, the communication have a tone of empathy and fairness and explanation, um, given where I think like society is going to be at and what, especially for anybody who has a consumer brand. Um, yeah. I think there's an yeah. element of all of this that becomes about um, the consumers as much as the applicants. Um, being kind of one in the same in many cases. I'm, I'm curious there. Um, I want to ask it within the context of, of what point in time do you see where it was that employers had, uh, I, I, I'm struggling with the word, but leverage is the one that keeps coming to my mind in terms of where the, the scale tipped in them. Um, and and I'll, I'll pause there. It's, it's a multi-part question. Sure. Yeah. I was thinking probably like great recession, like, um, being the, and then like before that nine 11, um, those kind of time periods, which created spikes and lots of people being unemployed, but at a different level and tone than now maybe. Yeah. And the, so the thing that I'm going to say, I said is multi-part, right? I think of the Nancy Tippins quote, the train has left the station, um, in yeah. terms of what happened with tests and the move to, online testing that coincided with those those two pieces which 9 11 and then you know the dot-com bubble if you look at the perspective of where the um stock market it took 13 years to recover to the pre-dot-com bubble um i think is a little bit telling in the dip that you had in the great recession there but i think back to the dynamics that changed around technology and then technology that went into the workplace circa like 2006 um, that preceded that great recession and the changes that you would have had for for applicants um, you know now those are pretty well integrated into the way mm -hmm. in which people apply for a job yeah yeah and uh, i mean in addition to like the market forces the accountability system has changed dramatically right so your ability to hold an organization accountable put them on blast mm -hmm. whether that's on Glassdoor, yeah four million active active monthly users on on glass door you can't hide right so organizations are held accountable for these practices and they need to be not only you know working to have that selfish and that's maybe the, the pejorative word there but you know they need to make sure they're hiring they have the right to hire good people 
but you also have the accountability and your, your candidates can hold those organizations accountable to how their practices are actually being perceived and whether or not they're fair and uh, a, a good experience. Yeah, well, Glassdoor is, it's interesting that you utilize that example because that's one, again, now we're, we're at the cross section of testing and um, kind of engagement space because one of the things that oftentimes individuals are looking at are, is the organization a destination employer with the proxy being Glassdoor scores, right? So it's one of the things that we might try and understand is if in an organization's engagement score is their true north, how does the increase in engagement score uh, appropriately correlate to a, an increase in Glassdoor scores? Does it? Um, does, does it? Yes. Uh, yes, is the, the kind of takeaway there. Um, simultaneously, uh, the thing that you would look at, you know, we've, or we have looked at in the past and, and actually the, the research is published on this, um, specifically related to um, increased frequency in surveying resulting in um, greater 52 week stock price performance. So publicly traded organizations, obviously are gonna have that as a metric, um, but it's one that translates really well, right? So, um, you, you know, you think of it as sales performance, revenue, what, what is the one that matters to your organization, um, right? I mean, we were both at SaaS organizations, so it's, it's likely multi-year in nature and subscription uh, related, but those are the types of things that, that you'd be looking at. Um, interestingly, you know, when I, when I think about that or, or um, maybe it's it's not so <laughs> interesting when when thinking about it but um it's when i say that i feel like you could easily jump to the conclusion of will is conflating surveying more with higher stock price performance <laughs> um and i appreciate that neither of you jumped on me for that but it's it's one of those things where it's it's telling in terms of the, the organizations that are doing that are having the opportunity to course correct more often. They're asking for that feedback. Um, they it, you know, have the ability to build that into their quarterly planning, for instance. So they can be much more dynamic in the way in which they react to market forces, changing um, times. And it gets us back to like what, what we started on all this uh, around EVP and the way in which they're mm -hmm. living you know, those types of things. So it's this kind of interesting dynamic, I, I believe, again, that you see that because it, it is those organizations that are asking for that feedback, asking for, um, you know, a shared uh, way in which to tackle difficult questions. Evidence-based talent practices lead to successful organizations? Uh, yeah, <laughs> data-driven, <laughs> data-driven in nature. That's what we like to hear, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Will, um, I'm mindful of our time here. I know you've got to, to get running to one of your uh, probably next conversations, but thank you so much for the time. Uh, it's always good catching up with you. You know, we text frequently, but still not enough. It's good to see you face to face. And thanks for bringing the fire to the fireside chat. Yes. <laughs> uh, love it. Absolutely love it. Um, we could probably talk for a lot more time and people would love to hear that, but where, where can they learn more um, about some of the stuff you've talked about and, and about what Glint is doing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the People Success Forum on LinkedIn is a phenomenal place for that. Uh, it's a way for individuals um, like us, like you know your your viewers, listeners. I don't I don't know what to call it in the fireside <laughs> chat. Um, you know, can find individuals like themselves to harness kind of the collective wisdom of the group. Right? There's a lot of companies that are dealing with this. There's a lot of ways in which. Um, they're putting that into that group and it's agnostic to um, Glint. It's, it's really meant to be an open community to understand uh, how to deal with these things. You had uh, referenced Lance, and I'm not sure if it was once we were recording or, or prior to that, uh, the Glint blog, which is a phenomenal space. Our people science organization has done a really great job of pulling in different resources in terms of how to deal with um, the crisis as well as other topics 
um, at this time. And I would definitely recommend that because they're they're constantly updating it um, yeah. as the situation changes. Uh, Looks like so you those are resources free there too. Some things that are usually behind a paywall. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and and related to that, um, it's it's a little late now, but uh, LinkedIn Learning has actually made a number of resources. Um, free specifically around um, the the move to remote work. One of or some of the more recent ones was they actually um, opened up a series on mindfulness um, that could be incredibly valuable. Uh, which I'll shoot you a, a link, Lance, afterwards so you could embed the, that. The exactly, we can. Yeah. You're gonna point to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that it, you know is incredibly could be incredibly valuable for, to folks, uh, kind of. Uh, at this time, so. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well, can't thank you enough. Appreciate yeah. it. And look forward to the to the next time. We'll have you on again sometime. Absolutely. It was so fun yeah. catching up with both of you. So, um, good to see you all again today. All right. Thank yep. you, everyone. Good to see you. Bye, everybody. See y'all.